Hello and welcome to NTD News Today. Kevin Hogan here. Let's take a look at our top stories. The rabbi who was held hostage over the weekend shares his story and what helped them survive. We have more details on the hostage taker too. Hundreds of students in Oakland, California are on strike, demanding more safety measures in schools amid the Omicron surge, while elsewhere some schools are opting out of mask mandates. A restaurant in New York City is defying the local vaccine mandate for its employees. The manager says most of his staff are fully vaccinated, but he tells us why he won't fire a veteran employee who hasn't received a second dose. Scores of people gather together for a vigil in Times Square to honor Michelle Goh. She was pushed to her death on subway tracks over the weekend. More details emerging about the man who took hostages in Texas on Saturday. But first, we hear from the rabbi whose training helped them survive. And today's Jessica Beatty has the story. Well, the, the rabbi Charlie Citron Walker was one of the four people taken captive at a Texas synagogue Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath. We were completely terrified. Worshippers invited stranger Malik Faisal Akram in when he knocked on their door. The British national pulled out a gun and held them hostage for nearly 11 hours. Right. He really thought that Jews controlled the world and that just calling up, uh, you know, calling up a rabbi, you know, would, would, would make all of his demands. That was, that was his idea. The active shooter training they'd taken months before, now a reality. That instruction helped me to understand that you need to act in moments where your life is threatened. Uh, there was a chair that was right in front of me, uh, and I was able to, I told the guys to go. I picked it up, and I threw it at him with all the adrenaline. With It was absolutely terrifying. All the hostages survived, and an FBI team killed Akram. Now more details are emerging. Officials say Akram arrived in New York on a tourist visa about two weeks ago. And the White House says he didn't raise any security flags. Um, he was checked against U.S. government databases multiple times prior to entering the country. And the U.S. government did not have any derogatory information about the individual in our systems at the time of entry. The BBC reports that Akram was known to British intelligence but was no longer considered a threat. Akram stayed overnight at this Dallas facility in early January. The head of the group says Akram was pleasant and nothing stood out. Of course, it was really shocking to see that this guy stayed at our facility, but also it's not very surprising. Um, we serve the most vulnerable population, and often a wolf in sheep's clothing will try to embed themselves within a vulnerable population. The White House says it's looking back and trying to learn every possible lesson in order to prevent attacks like this in the future. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. The New York Attorney General wants former President Donald Trump and his children to testify. She is pushing forward with her investigation into the Trump family's financial dealings. New York Attorney General Letitia James said in a statement that her investigation found wrongly valued assets and that those asset values were used to obtain benefits from financial institutions. She tweeted that Trump, Donald Trump Jr., and Ivanka Trump are closely involved in the transactions in question. James points to annual Trump Organization financial statements issued since 2004. She says there are discrepancies between the statements and supporting documents. Earlier this month, lawyers for the Trump family asked a judge to end the case. They called the probe unprecedented and unconstitutional. The committee probing the January 6, 2021 breach of the U.S. Capitol issues subpoenas to former President Trump's lawyer Rudy Giuliani and others connected with Trump during his time as president. The committee also subpoenaed attorneys Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis, along with former Trump campaign advisor Boris Epstein. The three lawyers and Epstein were ordered to hand over documents by February 1st and to sit for a February 8th deposition. It's unclear whether they will comply. The committee wrote on Twitter that the four individuals advanced unsupported theories about election fraud, pushed efforts to overturn election results, or were in direct contact with the former president. A lawyer for Giuliani said in an interview that the subpoena was political theater and that his client probably can't testify since he is bound by attorney-client privilege and executive privilege. The Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission announced a joint effort to review corporate merger guidelines. 
This amid growing antitrust concerns over a range of industries, specifically big tech. The agencies will consider updates that would help quell concerns over competition and consumer choice. It's been 10 years since the guidelines were last updated. They hope to release their findings by the end of this year. Measures to battle the Omicron surge are sparking debate in schools across the United States. In Oakland, California, student calls for more masks and testing to have grown into strike. While in Illinois, more schools are opting to make masks optional. Here are the details. More than 1,200 students in California's Oakland Unified School District signed a petition threatening to stay home until schools meet their COVID-19 safety demands. As of Tuesday, hundreds of students have failed to show up for school. We've been hearing that, uh, that this boycott could be more than just one day, and we encourage and we appreciate uh, their, their activism and we appreciate these, them bringing these issues to us. The petition asks the district to go back to remote learning until cases go down. It also requests access to N95 and KN95 masks for every student, plus COVID-19 testing twice a week. Students pledged to go on strike outside the Oakland Unified School District building on Friday if their requests are not met. The district spokesman says they're now addressing those demands, but noted that the school remains the safest place for students. The best place for them, uh, both from an educational standpoint and from a safety standpoint, we feel is in class, on campus, uh, where people are looking out for them, where everybody's wearing masks, where you know, so many of our staff and students are vaccinated. Outside California, the pandemic is causing a severe shortage of teachers in Oklahoma. Governor Kevin Stitt this week issued an unusual executive order, mobilizing state workers to fill the vacancies in schools. Just encourage all Oklahomans across the state of Oklahoma uh, to do what they can to, to maybe help substitute, if you've never substituted before, uh, to volunteer in your school district. And let's, uh, let's get through this together. While the Omicron wave is bringing mandates back to schools, points of controversy are also heating up. According to Illinois State Board of Education, three more public school districts have opted to make masking optional. They say the decision was made after evaluating the current pandemic situation, along with the academic, emotional, and physical well-being of the students. And on Capitol Hill, Congress members are questioning how the FDA authorized drug maker Pfizer's booster shot for kids ages 12 to 15. They found the top agency did not follow the typical committee approval process, which looks to ensure that the booster is safe for children's development. The Omicron variant's ability to spread quickly has created a great need for COVID-19 tests, leading to shortages and frustrations. This week, however, new measures are being put in place, and White House officials say they will make it easier for Americans to get a test. Here's what you need to know. New COVID-19 cases still high, hospitals still struggling, and when it comes to COVID-19 tests, an unprecedented demand. That's why we've had to take additional measures. We have a billion tests that will become available to people that they can order through the website. That website, covidtests.gov, launched Tuesday. Initially, there will be a limit of four tests per household. They're expected to be shipped within 7 to 12 days of being ordered. There are no shipping costs. Most Americans with private insurance can also now buy home tests online or in stores. Contact your insurer to find out if they provide direct coverage at the time of purchase or if claims must be submitted. Make sure to keep your receipt in case it's needed. Other things to know, you won't need a doctor's order or prescription to get the free tests. Insurers must pay for up to eight tests per covered person a month. As for any tests bought before January 15th, you won't be able to get reimbursed. If you're on Medicare, COVID-19 testing done in a lab when ordered by a medical professional comes at no charge. Those enrolled in Medicare Advantage plans should check with insurers to see if at-home test costs will be covered. (sighs) Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program cover home tests with no cost sharing, but enrollees should contact their state agencies for specific coverage details. Finally, for those uninsured, free home tests can be obtained from certain community health centers or requested through the federal program online. A free call line will also be launched for people without Internet access who want to get a free at-home test from the federal government. A launch date for that call line hasn't been provided yet. 
The CDC has updated its mask recommendations after a long nationwide call for N95 respirators. But what does the public have to say? Let's hear from some comments from the streets of New York. N95 manufacturers in the U.S. report record sales after health experts urged Americans to wear the highest quality masks possible. Yet the CDC is taking a turn from the national push for N95 since the pandemic. On its website, the agency now clarifies that Americans should wear the most protective mask you can that fits well and that you will wear consistently. New Yorkers reacted to the new mask guidance with mixed feelings. Uh, well, in my backpack, which I don't have on me, I do carry some KN95 masks. Um, the reason I like those is they seal better up here at the nose, and when I'm working with the glasses, it's a lot easier to see. I wear this fabric mask that I've worn since the beginning of the pandemic. I only put this on because I just came from a doctor's appointment, but this has kept me pretty safe for the past two years, so I'm pretty happy with it. K95 is like that, like the name, 95 is 95% protection, rather than the other ones that are 25 or less protection, I guess that they're on the, the blue ones that everybody wear, they you know, fit preferably into your face, like, so that's what I prefer the other one. The CDC maintains that N95 respirators offer the best level of protection, adding loosely woven cloth products provide the least protection. But there are still complaints about the N95 model's tight fit. It's a little bit more restrictive. I think it's more for people who are working in construction, uh, in the industry. Well, it's a good, I, I, I understand it's a good protection, but still, if it's, it's difficult to breathe in them. The CDC recommends that people consider wearing an N95 mask when caring for COVID-19 patients. Other applicable settings include long rides on public transportation and in crowded indoor spaces, if not up to date on vaccinations. President Biden also pledged last week to make high quality masks available to Americans for free. In another step, the White House said the government will distribute 500 million COVID-19 tests for free later this month. And now we hear from a restaurant manager, Stratus Morfogan, who is defying New York City's vaccine mandate. He says employees at the Brooklyn Chop House will not have to show proof of full vaccination to keep their jobs. In late December, the city issued a vaccine mandate for all employees who interact with the public. Now, Morfogan says 90% of his staff have two doses of the vaccine, but 10% have only one shot. In regards to this, he tells us how he's handling the mandate. I just said, hey, just, just raise your hands if you guys have one or two vaccines. And everybody raised their hands. And that was it. I'm not policing it. People are not going to get a jab for a job threat. And, you know, we have so many things that I post on my Instagram. Like, for example, I have Alex, my waiter, who I just posted. It's been with me 15 years. He got COVID. He went off for three weeks to get better. He came back. Uh, he, he already had one vaccine. His doctor's like, oh, yo, you just got natural antibodies. You don't need vaccine, too. And you know what? Technically, Governor Hochul will make me fire Alex, who's been with me for 15 years. So I did basically, I, I threatened her by saying, hey, come and arrest me. I will be arrested for my staff anytime. And what about your patrons? Do they have to show proof of vaccination? So early on, uh, basically, I was blatantly disregarding the rule. But, you know, dictatorship that we have in New York, they came at me very strong because I called Cuomo Comrade Cuomo. This is before he was removed. And he said, you see that liquor license? The SLA said, you see that liquor license? If you blatantly disregard the rule for, uh, you know, imposing the vax card, um, we will remove your liquor license. Hence, in turn, we would have to close down our restaurant and 100 employees would be out of business. So they got me there. That was checkmate. One other thing, the vax card is the super spreader. And that's what politicians don't understand, that with a vax card, you could be asymptomatic positive. You could walk into a crowded restaurant, spread this thing throughout the restaurant. We, you know, we, we want to get rid of this ent entirely, but we had a compromise that we said to Eric Adams recently is convert it to a health pass. Get a negative test within 48 hours, knowing you're going to a public establishment. And at least that's a compromise. And I will tell you, that's even safer than showing me a vax card. Well, that brings me to my next question, Stratus. These vaccine mandates have been put in place to protect public health. You have chosen not to enforce it for your employees. What if a patron comes in and gets sick as a result? Well, how could they? So if my employees with a, vac with a vaccination or not a vaccination, they still spread it. You know, they, they can still spread it. The good news is that my staff is, 
at least with one vaccine. And, and, and the best part is every time you check in and clock in at Brooklyn Chop House or Dumpling Chop, you get the swab. We got the Q-tip swab made by Abbott Labs and everybody gets a home check. Everybody, as soon as you clock in, it takes 12 minutes to give me a negative or positive test. If you are negative for COVID, you know what? Enjoy your day at work. If you're positive, please go home, get better, and your job awaits. Morfogan says back in March 2020, his employees helped prepare and deliver 8,400 meals as a donation to healthcare workers. He says this is one of the reasons why he's hesitant to fire them over the vaccine. Scores of people gathered on Tuesday for a vigil in Times Square to honor Michelle Goh and to denounce anti-Asian violence. Goh was pushed to her death on subway tracks on Saturday. NTD's Andrew Thomas reports. The incident has not been deemed a hate crime by the NYPD, but local Asian American communities have noted the general increase in attacks against members since the pandemic began in 2020. Sadly, in New York City, in 2020, while everybody was quarantining and hate crimes across the city dropped, hate crimes against the AAPI community rose by 800%. Go, 40, was an executive with Deloitte. Her family has said they are still in shock at losing their daughter. The New York Post reports that they are demanding justice for her death. There are too many people, especially in the Asian American community, who are terrified, terrified to walk the streets, terrified to go to the grocery store, to take the subways, to leave their homes. Go was killed after being shoved onto the tracks. The outlet says she was on the southbound NQRW platform at West 42nd Street and Broadway at around 9.40 a.m. We must deal with crime in real time. But yes, there's some things that we can do every day by saying hello, good morning, and interacting with each other, and no longer allowing our city to be an isolated city where we lean into the places we disagree instead of the places we agree. Simon Marshall, 61, was arrested on Saturday. He was charged with second-degree murder for allegedly pushing go. I know we are all heartbroken that Michelle's life was cut so short, but what does make me happy is that I know Michelle lived her life to the fullest. Michelle, we will miss you deeply, but know that you will always be in our hearts and memories. Thank you. On Monday, the family of Go released a statement on Twitter expressing their shock at their loss. We are in a state of shock and grieving the loss of our daughter, sister, and friend, they said. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. New Jersey will soon require that Asian American and Pacific Islander history be taught in public schools. Governor Phil Murphy signed the legislation on Tuesday, making it mandatory to include the new curriculum in grades K through 12 starting next year. New Jersey is only the second state after Illinois to require the curriculum change. The state is also establishing a commission for Asian American heritage within its Department of Education. A South Carolina judge has denied Alex Murdoch's motion to reduce his bond. A judge, Allison Lee, said previously that Murdoch's bond in December was set at $7 million for 48 charges. Murdoch's wife and one of his sons were fatally shot last June. That crime is still unsolved. Murdoch admitted that he later conspired to have one of his former clients kill him as part of a fraud scheme. Prosecutors say the goal was for Murdoch's only surviving son to collect a $10 million life insurance payout. In denying his bond reduction, the court ruling specified that Murdoch is still a flight risk and a potential danger to himself and the community. Sheriff's Department body cam footage captured the aftermath of a bear attack in Florida. A woman was injured by a black bear while walking her dog in Darbury, Florida around 9 p.m. last week. Although she was scratched across her face, she expressed the most concern about her black lab. But the dog was able to escape uninjured, and fortunately, the owner's injuries were not life-threatening. The owner said the bear jumped on her and threw her on the ground. Florida Fish and Wildlife officers found the bear in a tree nearby, along with her three cubs. The mother bear, who was responsible for the attack, had to be put down, but her three yearlings, at least 100 pounds each, were deemed old enough to survive and let go on their own. 
Toronto residents are busy clearing up the roads after heavy snowstorms hit the region. The storms dumped nearly two feet of snow between Sunday and Monday. That's a lot of snow, even for a city like Toronto. Here are the details. Hundreds of plows clear the streets of Toronto as weather conditions ease the day after heavy snowfall in Ontario, Canada. Some local residents say it's unusual even for them to see this much snow. No, I've never experienced snow like this in Toronto in my 20-something years of living here. A low-pressure system tracking south of the Great Lakes brought between 15 and 24 inches of snowfall to the region on Monday. The weather conditions forced road closures and flight cancellations and left some motorists stranded for several hours. As you can see, we're clearing snow and taking lots of micro breaks, trying to save the back. Toronto Mayor John Tory said on Tuesday that all staff and plows were out and on the job, but crews were experiencing challenges due to abandoned or parked cars. Classes were canceled Monday and Tuesday. Some people enjoy the day off by riding down snowy slopes and building snowmen. We understand that they have to cancel the schools, and uh, obviously they, they can't keep it safe in terms of cars and buses getting through. You have no choice, so I think, uh, it, you know, it was the right decision, but, uh, you know, it, it should be a proper snow day. That means they shouldn't be work, staying in school and in the house. They should actually go out and have fun, so that's what's happening. And it's not just humans enjoying the snow. A two-year-old dog named Miley was seen having fun in a backyard blanketed in snow on Monday. The dog owner says this was the most amount of snow Miley ever had to deal with at once. And just to give you an idea of how much snow fell in the region, a resident in Beckwith, Ontario, captured how the snow accumulated overnight on her balcony in a time-lapse video. Coming up, a family-run firm is helping the Pacific Island Tonga after natural disasters left the island nation devastated. Endangered coho salmon welcomed the heavy rains that soaked California late last year, and an abundance of rain and snow arrive in time for the November to January spawning season. All that and more after this short break. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, CEO of MyPillow. Cancel culture has not only affected myself and MyPillow, but also millions of you out there. My employees and I want to personally thank each and every one of you for all your support. At MyPillow, we have hundreds of products now, including my new slippers, bathrobes, sleepwear, and my new beds. We are offering the best products ever for the best prices ever. For example, we have the standard size My Pillows, regularly $69.98, now only $19.98 with your promo code. Or you can get custom fit with my premium queen size My Pillows, regularly $79.98, now just $29.98 or my king size, regularly $89.98, now just $34.98. So go to MyPillow.com now and use the promo code on your screen or call the 1-800 number below to receive these exclusive offers. Thank you and God bless. A family-owned business in California that's been shipping to Tonga for decades is pitching in to help the island nation in the wake of its deadly volcanic eruption and tsunami. SF Enterprises and Logistics have moved freight to Tonga for 37 years. Their operations manager, Celia Lengi Pahulu, says they're prioritizing water among other critical supplies. We've just been taking a lot of water because we know 
the water supply is going to be completely gone. There's no municipal water in Donga. They de depend on rainwater. And so I'm sure all the tanks are filled with debris and ash. So if anything, anyone that calls to want to try to help, we just tell them water. That's what we could do right now. The disaster severed an undersea communications cable, cutting much of Tonga off from the rest of the world. Information on the scale of the devastation has mostly come from reconnaissance aircraft. Lengi Pahulu says her shipping company has yet to hear back from family or work colleagues. We all have family there still, you know, and you know our staff is our family too. So it's it definitely hits close to home. I mean, we're all we're all just trying to do it day by day and, and try not to be so sad about the whole situation because without having contact, we really don't know what the direct need is. The ship from Oakland will take four to five weeks. Ships carrying supplies and relief equipment, including water, have left from ports in Australia and New Zealand. New Zealand's Navy says their vessels are expected to arrive on Friday. The heavy rains that soaked California late last year were welcomed by farmers and urban planners, but they were also appreciated by another group, endangered coho salmon. California received more precipitation from October to December than in the previous 12 months, according to the National Weather Service. Well, this has been a really exciting spawning season here. Um, we got a lot of rain all at once, and the fish were able to get up into small tributaries where they normally aren't seen. The abundance of rain and snow arrived in time for the November to January spawning season in the resource-rich Tamales Bay watershed north of San Francisco. Experts say it enabled some fish to reach tributaries of the Lagunitas Creek at least 13 miles inland in Marin County. And some fish have been spotted a mile upstream, from where the San Geronimo Creek had been dammed until little more than a year ago. We've seen fish in places that they haven't been for almost 25 years. And I think that's, that's definitely a, a sign of the winter that we've had so far. It's great rain, long duration storms that have allowed fish to pass through culverts that are also hard to get through and they can get up into those tributaries. The rain could easily be a mere pause in the state's 20-year drought. The lack of water has complicated efforts by officials to keep fish, farms, and growing cities supplied. Because they like these really tiny, small streams, and that's where their survival is the highest. But if they can't get there because of the obstacles that us as humans have put there, then they're not gonna survive. Experts say the state needs several wet years in a row to replenish reservoirs. In the meantime, the fish are benefiting from the recent rains. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Another item on your grocery list is getting more expensive. Orange juice sales have surged during the pandemic, and now prices are headed higher too. Citrus disease and the less than favorable weather conditions have hurt orange crops over the past few years. The USDA expects Florida to produce nearly 45 million boxes of oranges in 2022. That would be the smallest harvest from the state in nearly 80 years. And it's not just oranges seeing price jumps. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, food made at home was 6.5% more expensive than it was last year. White Castle will not be a Valentine's Day destination this year. The burger chain is canceling its fine dining event due to the pandemic. White Castle usually offers $1 burgers and french fries at select locations on February 14th. It also redecorates the restaurants into fine dining rooms, complete with reservations, hostess seating, and tableside service. Instead, White Castle is offering a to-go Valentine special, featuring a meal for two. A Boston case has reached the nation's highest court, at the heart of the debate is how Boston City Hall rejected the rising of a flag with Christian cross. The display has previously flown LGBT flags and communist Chinese flags. In 2017, Boston refused to let Camp Constitution display a fag flag picturing a Christian cross, claiming it would be an improper endorsement of Christianity by the city. On the other hand, the Supreme Court was told that allowing national flags and flags depicting historic events, causes, and organizations while refusing to raise a Christian flag would be an unconstitutional example of government censorship. The founder of Liberty Council law firm told the court that Boston officials have allowed almost 300 different flag raising approvals with no denials and usually no review but denied the flag application submitted by Camp Constitution because the application contained the word Christian. 
The lawyer argues that the city's flag flying has been part of a public forum open to all applicants, and therefore the local government's argument about the separation between church and state doesn't apply. A billionaire and partial owner of the NBA's top teams is facing backlash over his comments on human rights in China. He said that nobody cares about the Chinese Communist Party's suppression of the Uyghur minority group. We hear more from NTD's David Lam. In a January 15th podcast with the All In podcast, one of the co-hosts and CEO of Social Capital said that nobody cares about the Uyghurs in concentration camps in China's western Xinjiang region. Nobody cares about what's happening to the Uyghurs, okay? You, you bring it up because you really what? care, and I think what that's nice that you cares? care. The rest of us don't care. Polly Hapatia was responding to another co-host who brought up Washington's recent ban on all products imported from Xinjiang's forced labor camps. He adds that the issue is below his line and there are more domestic issues to focus on. Not until we can take care of ourselves will I prioritize them over us. Polly Hapatia owns 10% of the Golden State Warriors. The team's management responded saying that Polly Hapatia is a limited investor and his views do not reflect those of the organization. The podcast co-host countered by saying that human rights is a global concept and its open discussion is allowed in the U.S. but not in certain other countries. A number of critics respond, including Ennis Cancer Freedom, one of the few NBA players to be vocal on China's human rights. He calls it a shame. Freedom previously talked on BBC about encouraging his colleagues about choosing morals over money. So it is important that at this uses a platform to be the voice of all those innocent people out there who don't have a voice. Florida Senator Rick Scott said Communist China is imprisoning innocent people simply due to their Muslim faith and silence is appeasement. He asked several Warriors players to condemn it. The United States and other Western nations have characterized Beijing's repressive policy in Xinjiang as a genocide. Pali Hapatia also said that after reviewing the podcast, he realized he came across as lacking empathy. He said his family previously fled a country with its own human rights issues. David Lam, NTD News, California. Dr. Anthony Fauci's financial records were recently disclosed and it's sending the White House's chief medical advisor right into another round of controversy. NTD's Tiffany Meyer has more on the story. A newly released financial record is putting a U.S. health expert in the spotlight. The controversy revolves around Dr. Anthony Fauci. His recent financial disclosure shows the doctor has significant investments in Chinese companies. According to Fauci's 2020 financial statement, first released by U.S. Senator Roger Marshall on Friday, Fauci held approximately $10 million in investments, including in a particular fund named the Matthews Pacific Tiger Fund. According to the fund's fact sheet, nearly half of this money went into companies based in China and Hong Kong. Many of them are linked to Beijing and benefit from its policies. Included are tech company Tencent, online shopping giant Alibaba, Hong Kong exchange and clearing, and drug developer Wuxi Biologics. Among them, Tencent has been known to comply with the Chinese regime's demands, like collecting users' personal data, monitoring online activity, and censorship. Those practices also extend outside China to U.S.-based and other international users of its messaging app WeChat. Besides Tencent, Chinese e-commerce giant Alibaba has been accused of cybersecurity risks and espionage by U.S. investigators. For Fauci, the disclosed financial information comes at a hectic time. That's amid dwindling public trust in his handling of the pandemic as chief medical advisor to Biden. Last week, the Senate summoned Fauci to a hearing over suggestions that he lied to Congress about his gain-of-function work. The controversy continued this week after Senator Roger Marshall accused Fauci of lying on another occasion, this time on his finances. In a statement, Marshall wrote, just like he has misled the American people about gain-of-function research, about masks, testing, and more, Dr. Fauci was completely dishonest about his financial disclosures being open to the public. Previously, Fauci claimed he had made his earnings public for nearly four decades. Still to come, Italy will soon have a new president. A former four-time prime minister could have a chance. The Italian parliament will start voting soon. Europe shuts down VPNlab.net. It's been the virtual private network of choice for cyber criminals. 
What are the implications for web privacy? Learn more about that here on NTD News. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep, or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility, and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money, physical gold and silver. Because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384. Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new precious metals IRA. Call now. Someone has to find the way to build the Great Dome. Completely new, completely original. The 2022 NTD 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition will be held at the Merkin Hall of Kaufman Music Center in New York City. The competition is honored to have specially invited vocalists with the world-renowned Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve on its panel of judges. The gold award is $10,000. The 2022 8th International Chinese Vocal Competition. For more information, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. A Belgian court today sentenced the head of a Vietnamese human trafficking gang to 15 years in prison. He was convicted of manslaughter and the deaths of 39 Vietnamese citizens. The victims died from suffocation while being smuggled into Britain, transported inside an airtight shipping container. Most of them came from provinces in north-central Vietnam. Poor employment prospects there fueled interest in migration on top of environmental disasters and the promise of economic rewards overseas. The prison sentence against gang leader Vo Van Hong also came with a fine of about $1 million. The over 200-page verdict accuses him of treating the victims like inhuman cargo. Hong also charged them nearly $28,000 each for the trip to Britain. A Belgian human trafficking lawyer welcomed the verdict. He said any abuse of the suffering of others who are looking for a better life and a better world would not be tolerated. The Italian parliament will convene on January 24th to begin voting for a new head of state. Former four-time Prime Minister Silvio Berlusconi, 85, is emerging from the shadows to become a central figure in the presidential discussions. Silvio Berlusconi. He has been, of course, very controversial. He has been uh, condemned. He has been excluded from Parliament. Is emerging from the shadows to become a central figure in Italy's presidential discussions. Berlusconi believes he is one of the most important persons, possibly the most important historical figure in Italy. The Italian parliament will convene on January 24th to begin voting for a new head of state. And center right parties have confirmed they want the embattled former prime minister as their candidate. But could he really make it? This is what Berlusconi is looking for. He's looking for an applause for the recognition by Italy of his importance. Giovanni Orsina is a professor of history at Luis University in Rome. I think on the whole it is rather unlikely. If he were anyone else but Berlusconi, I would say it's zero percent. Given that Berlusconi has made us use to his uh, missions impossible and that he really has achieved targets that uh, to everyone seemed uh, unreachable, then uh, I say it's not 0%, it is maybe 5%. Berlusconi has been campaigning tirelessly behind the scenes and has mobilized his media empire behind his bid. 
The 85-year-old and former four-time prime minister potentially stands in the way of current PM Mario Draghi. Italy's center-left Democratic Party has categorically ruled out backing the billionaire media tycoon. And the anti-establishment five-star movement, which has the largest number of parliamentarians, has echoed that sentiment. On the streets of Rome, support is mixed. Allora, secondo la mia opinione, se vince Berlusconi... If Berlusconi wins, there should be a demonstration because it seems ridiculous to me that a person like Berlusconi could win. Che possa vincere una persona come Berlusconi. Oddio, sta un po' avanti con l'età, però... He's a bit old, but we'll see what happens. As a politician, he's done well. He's also had legal problems, but he's always been acquitted. He could do well. Berlusconi's right-hand man and lower house deputy Vittorio Sgarbi has said he suspended his efforts to persuade undecided lawmakers because it was proving, quote, a desperate task. After all, Berlusconi has a record that includes tax fraud and the scandal over his notorious bunga bunga sex parties while he was last in office. I mean, who can be surprised of anything that Berlusconi does. Uh, Berlusconi, as I said, is a person that has demonstrated in time to be able to do things that anyone el no one else would dare do. Poland is facing its worst wave of COVID-19 infections to date, but for skiers visiting southern resorts during the winter holidays, that's not much of a concern. Countries like Austria and Italy already require COVID-19 passports for ski lifts but there is no such requirement in Poland. According to the country's regulations, the unvaccinated can take up only 30% of the capacity of public places, restaurants included. But implementation has been a challenge and not everyone complies with such rules because checking for vaccination relies only on questions and answers instead of proof or other visible evidence. The French education minister is facing calls to resign he was found taking a vacation at a European resort island while he announced France's latest CCP virus restriction on schools. The rules caused a major uproar and led French teachers to strike last week. It was later reported that the education minister was on vacation in Ibiza while parents and teachers struggled to meet the new restrictions. He announced more testing requirements for students and now Jean-Michel Blanquer calls, faces calls to resign. Blanca says he re regrets how his vacation looked, but said he didn't break any laws. He told France's National Assembly he probably should have chosen a different place to vacation. A government spokesman says Blanca was working remotely while he was away. Europol has shut down VPN Lab, which it calls a provider of choice for cybercriminals. What impact does this have on the world of cybercrime? Entity's Faye Quarter has more. European law enforcement has shut down VPN Lab, a go-to VPN for cyber criminals. Europol says it grounded 15 of VPN Lab servers in multiple countries. The VPN simply stands for Virtual Private Network, and it's really a service that protects your internet connection. Scott Schober is the author of Cybersecurity is Everybody's Business. Schober says VPNs keep a person's online data private by encrypting it. However, cyber criminals also use them to hide illegal activity. And a lot of that activity is on VPN lab servers. And that's important for investigators and Europol and law enforcement because they can put together the evidence and prove that a lot of the, the mischief that's been going on is being conducted through VPN labs. In a press release, Europol says it became suspicious of VPN lab after multiple investigations connected it to cybercrime. Investigators even found advertisements for VPN lab on the dark web. If you are doing illegal activity through a VPN service, a legit one is going to turn this stuff over. This particular one is resistant to do so. Brian Horning is the CEO of Exact IT Solutions. Horning says this is a selling point for VPN Lab and why Europol had to forcefully shut it down. Horning also says this isn't a huge takedown for cyber crime. A lot of cyber criminals also have the capability to set up their own. So it's not too difficult to figure out how to set up your own. The head of Europol's European Cybercrime Center says criminals are running out of ways to hide their tracks online. Each investigation we undertake informs the next, and the information gained on potential victims means we may have preempted several serious cyber attacks. Faye Quarter, NTD News. 
Just ahead, the Marvel Cinematic Universe gets a new superhero. Hollywood actor Oscar Isaac will play the protagonist in a new miniseries called Moon Knight. Stay tuned to find out more. Diehard Disney fans reportedly waited for more than six hours to buy a limited edition Figment popcorn bucket. Figment the Purple Dragon holds a special place in the hearts of Disney fans, and he's the star of Epcot Journeys into Imagination Ride, and it's known as the park's mascot. The massive lines for the $25 buckets formed at Epcot's International Festival of the Arts in Florida on Friday. Some fans wanted the souvenirs so badly that there were reports of guests offering $100 to people in the front of the line just to buy them one. Fans of Marvel Studios can expect a new TV series featuring a new superhero. The trailer of the Moon Knight series aired during the NFL wildcard halftime on Monday. Let's take a look. Hello and welcome to Staying Awake. Moon Knight will be the latest superhero in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. 42-year-old Hollywood actor Oscar Isaac dons a gray cape and an English accent for his role of the protagonist. In the comics, Moon Knight's alter ego is Mark Spector, but in a twist from the comics, Isaac plays Stephen Grant, a mild-mannered gift shop employee. You're bloody useless, Stevie. Stephen. Grant struggles from dissociative identity disorder and becomes plagued with blackouts and memories of another life. Thank you. Lost the contact lens. Hope you find it. Thanks. He would later discover that he shares a body with Mark Spector. Now hold the phone. Yeah. Oh my God, you're alive. What's wrong with you, Mark? Why did you call me Mark? It must be very difficult. The trailer shows Grant eventually becoming Moon Knight, a superhero gifted with abilities by an Egyptian god. There's chaos in here. The series will also feature Ethan Hawke and French actor Gaspard Ulliel. According to IMDb.com, one of the episodes is directed by George Clooney. Moon Knight will premiere on Disney Plus on March 30th. There will be six episodes, and the series is part of Phase 4 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. French media reported earlier today that actor Gaspard Ulliel has died at age 37 following a ski accident in the Alps. He reportedly collided with another skier and suffered a traumatic brain injury. Ulliel won a French Caesar Award for Best Actor for his role in the 2017 film It's Only the End of the World. Take your seat, put on your favorite movie, and pull out the popcorn. Wednesday, January 19th, is a day to celebrate one of America's favorite salty, buttery snacks. Popcorn was used by the Aztecs in the 16th century for headdresses during ceremonies. Popcorn as a food started becoming popular in the U.S. in the mid-1800s. In the 1900s, peanuts and molasses were added and Cracker Jacks were born. Americans consume 13 billion quarts of popcorn a year, more than any other country in the world. A majority of the popcorn produced in the world is grown here, and Nebraska leads the way in production. So whether you like it sweet or savory, it's time to honor the beloved movie snack that truly never gets old. Emirates Airline does it again. The airline sent a stunt woman in a flight attendant uniform up to buy's Burj Khalifa. Hi, Mom. I'm on top of the world. Last August, Emirates' video ad went viral after Nicole Smith Ludwig ascended 828 meters to the very top of the building spire. Now in the new photos and video released this week, she's up there again to promote Expo 2020 Dubai. With the city spread out below, her jumbo, a super jumbo glides past her half a mile away before going on a fly past over the expo site. The impressive feat took place over two days in October 2021. It involved an Airbus 380 circulating the Burj Khalifa 11 times at the exact height of the building. 
Thanks for watching. At NTD, we're honored to be your source for the news. Catch us again tonight at 6.30 Eastern. In New York City, I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.